public seminar on swinging the vote, how the CCP influences the media and elections in Taiwan and beyond. Uh, it's a special treat for me to have the reporters and journalists here because usually this is the first time they're usually they're right there and they're asking us the hard questions. Now we can reverse the roles. They're sitting here and you get to ask them the hard questions. So it's a really special day at GTI. To introduce GTI, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit think tank dedicated to public education. We have several programs. One is our bi-weekly publication, the Global Taiwan Brief. Um, if you haven't received it, if you haven't signed up to receive it, you can put your name on the list at the front desk. Go on our website and it's a free subscription to this bi-weekly publication. Our second program is um, our public seminars, which is what you're seeing here today as we gather the experts to talk about various topics in politics, society, economics, security. Um, and we also run a special uh, public seminar program, uh, not some, but others on democracy and human rights in co cooperation with the uh, Taiwan Foundation for Democracy in Taipei. Um, and our third major program is our symposium, that's our flagship program. Um, and that happens every September, so stay tuned for the details. The whole day um, of Taiwan issues, Taiwan US, world, talking social, economic, political security. Um, and we also, GTI sponsors for US scholars to do research in Taiwan this past year. sent six scholars to Taiwan, uh, usually PhD uh, professors or PhD students, um, and also uh, previous uh, retired and the U.S. government to go out there and to research. We have Leo Bosner, who is our scholar uh, for the past year as well. Um, and we also bring scholars from Taiwan to the United States as GTI fellows. And they get to come here, and then uh, they're resident fellows here for a few months, and they do research, and we uh, provide support for them. So we send out, and we bring Taiwan fellows here to Washington, D.C. Everything that we do could not be possible without the strong support uh, from our advisors. So special um, to our uh, chairman, Dr. Chen, here. And we have Dr. Tai. We have our vice chairman, Jennifer Hu. And I see a lot of advisors here in the audience today. Uh, we have Garrett Vanderwees. We had a few others, but that was, I think they were here for the previous. So, and also um, a, a big thanks to the assistance of our staff as well. Um, our executive director, director Russell Shao, uh, Marcia and um, Jonathan, uh, Catherine, who's currently in Taiwan on the Mosaic program with TechRow, and our new intern, Michael, in the back. Okay, to introduce the topic, um, swinging the vote, when we first sent out the invitations for this and the description that you see on the website, it focused on what happened a month and a half, two months ago at the May conference in Beijing, where CCP, the Chinese Communist Party's Politburo Standing Committee member, Wang Yang, stated that media outlets in Taiwan should give more coverage of one country, two systems framework for class straight unification touted by Chinese leader Xi Jinping. So in response, Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen strongly condemned China's interference in Taiwan's internal affairs and um, interference in the freedom of the press. He had summit that when he made those statements, that was a summit in Beijing organized by Beijing Daily Group, co-hosted by Taiwan-based media company Wat Wat, uh, China Times as well as involving other Taiwanese media companies. And, and these such activities raise questions about how China's influence over media, freedom, democracy, and elections all connect to one another. But even though we wrote that when we first planned this meeting, I think what makes this discussion today more timely is what we're seeing in the front pages of the newspapers today, in the past few days, with the protests in Hong Kong. So these protests in Hong Kong, they're over a million people in the streets pushing back against this proposed extradition agreement with China. So specifically, the, the critics of the bill say that this is going to apply China's justice system and its tough rules against dissent to the people of Hong Kong for those who are then extradited to China. And it really runs contrary to this one country, two systems narrative. But more generally, um, protests in Hong Kong are reacting to China's influence over Hong Kong's media, freedom, democracy, elections, uh, with implications for Taiwan. So we here at GTI have um, organized this expert group of panelists to talk about such influences in Taiwan, the U.S., and the rest of the world. To introduce our speakers, 
On our right, we have uh, J. Michael Cole. He just flew in from Taipei, and we're glad that he could join us for this. He's a Taipei-based policy analyst, a senior non-resident fellow here at the Global Taiwan Institute, senior non-resident fellow with the University of Nottingham in the UK, as well as several other affiliations. From, from 2014 to 2016, he was an employee of Thinking Taiwan Foundation, a think tank founded by President Tsai Ing-wen, where he was the chief editor. He was deputy news chief and columnist reporter at the Taipei Times from 2006 to 2013. We're glad to have him here now. To his right is Ms. Natalie Liu. She, her journalist, journalism career has included working as Beijing bureau producer, CBS News, and as foreign affairs reporter for the Washington Times. She currently works as a staff reporter for Voice of America, and it was awarded first place in media online journalism by the Chesapeake Associated Press Broadcast Association in June 2018. To the far left, Mike Masidig was a senior producer for foreign affairs defense at PBS NewsHour from 1985 to 2012. He's now an adjunct lecturer in media and international affairs at SAIS, makes frequent overseas reporting trips, as well as follows policy making in Washington think tanks. His reports are on the online PBS News Hour and other publications. To my media left, Media Defense Hao, is the director of the Mandarin Service at Radio Free Asia. Before joining RFA in 2018, Media had been the Washington bureau chief for Liberty Times and Taipei Times Taiwan since 1998. The highlights of Media coverage in Washington include an exclusive story in 2016 about that historical phone call between President Trump and Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen. She also broke the story in 2014 when Chinese jet fighter Su-27, Su-27 aircraft, locked in on Taiwanese President Chen Shui-bian's airplane on uh, the I'm the moderator. I'm David On, Senior Research Fellow here at the Global Taiwan Institute, formerly U.S. State Department, covering uh, East Asia for five and a half years as a political military officer. And this reaches way back, actually, to my days as well when I was a U.S. Fulbright Scholar in Taiwan researching elections and democracy in Taiwan, and traveling throughout China, researching China's village elections. So um, with that, I'm going to turn over to our q &A. I'm going to jump straight into it. Our q &A format is different than a lot of think tanks. Um, I'm going to start with a more in-depth presentation by Michael Cole, but then most of our back and forth, our questions and answers are going to be maybe two or three minutes, more fast-paced, and I invite the speakers to also, when they hear something that they want to contribute to, um, to jump in and have a conversation with each other. And then later, I'm going to open it up to the whole audience to then ask questions for the speakers here. So to get into it, uh, first question for Michael Cole. Uh, could you please explain uh, CCP influence, the Chinese Communist Party's influence, on Taiwan media based on your experience on the ground in Taipei? Correct. I've been told to speak very closely to the microphone, so I'll lean over. Okay, well, thank you, David, for the kind introduction and, and the question. Uh, good afternoon, to everybody. Uh, I did it, broke the computer. Um, yeah, I've been asked to talk about uh, Chinese interference in, in media environment in Taiwan, and uh, it's a very immediate, pressing issue uh, in Taiwanese society. So kick me under the table if I go be on 10 minutes, because I could talk for an hour. Um, <laughs> There's something more over the wires. Sorry about that. <coughs> well, first of all, I mean, uh, it's important to state that uh, disinformation, misinformation, computational propaganda, and all these activities uh, that are part of information warfare targeting Taiwan, uh, they all occur in, in a larger context of. Uh, active measures taken by uh, the Chinese Communist Party uh, to shape the environment in Taiwan in its in its favor. <laughs> it starts now. Um, okay, it's back. Uh, do not touch this wire. Uh, so basically, there's a. Uh, been giving a series of talks on, on Chinese interference, uh, including one yesterday at the Canadian Embassy. Uh, I come up with basically 
six main pillars for Chinese uh, performance opt against Taiwan and the objectives. Uh, basically, in order is, is to corral the bypass, manipulate democratic institutions, elections, and public trust therein. A second one is undermine the morale of the targeted society and weaken resistance to Beijing's objectives. A uh, third one is to sow confusion uh, within Taiwanese society. Number four is to co-opt elites, business people, politicians, retired military officers, uh, civil society, as well as the media, the subject of our talk today. Uh, fifth one is to coerce the CCP's opponents and critics, both in Taiwan and worldwide. And the sixth is to exacerbate feelings of abandonment, isolation, and inevitability uh, in among the Taiwanese. <laughs> so one uh, key battleground for all these activities is uh, the use, as I said, of uh, computational propaganda, uh, disinformation, misinformation, content farms, uh, and other means, electronic and not, uh, that are all aimed at reinforcing six points that I just, uh, just talked about. As David was uh, was saying, uh, uh, there is willing participation by some traditional media organizations in Taiwan in these activities, and chief among them is uh, the Wall China Times Group, uh, which was indicated a few months ago, uh, has been receiving uh, financial support by the uh, People's Republic of China uh, in the hundreds of millions dollars since 19, uh, since 2007 uh, via its holdings company in Hong Kong. Now the uh, the ownership of China, one China claims that uh, these injections of money uh, did not influence their editorial line uh, and that these are actually two separate entities. So you can this what you want, uh, but I have a few slides and uh, this is a composite slide based on uh, different investigative reports that basically show the constellation of companies that are owned by by Tsai uh, and his son and the, the Watch China Times Group. <coughs> you can see that they operate hotels, they're in the uh, insurance industry, they're in the media, they're selling crackers, they're going to hospitals, uh, and there's indications that they're parking their money as well in you know, the usual suspect area like Cayman Islands and whatnot. Uh, so it, it makes the life of investigators and journalists quite difficult to see money is being moved around, where it's coming from, and whether it's being used to support uh, arms of the media that do appear to be uh, reflecting China's presence when it comes to Taiwan. Uh, we know for a fact that uh, the China Times media, whether print, the China Times newspaper, or magazine, or television, uh, CTIT, uh, have been reinforcing uh, the one country, two systems and unification narrative for, for many years, uh, ever since uh, Mr. Tsai became the owner of that company. Uh, and there's also a large element of self-censorship. Uh, if you watch CTI TV nowadays, I can guarantee you, you will not see reports on what's going on in Hong Kong right now. You will not see reports on the concentration camps in Xinjiang nowadays. Uh, but you will see a lot, hell of a lot of reporting on how great someone like Hang Wu uh, would be one's economy should he become uh, the Taiwanese president. Um, again, is are they uh, is their editorial line being dictated by the Chinese Communist Party? We can't prove that, uh, but they're certainly uh, reflecting its preferences uh, for reasons that very likely have to do with uh, Mr. Uh, Tsai's uh, investments and business operations back in China. We have to be careful when we talk about these uh, these companies because they tend to uh, be litigious certain claims about their proximity to CCP, so I will not go there, but I would say that there's certainly interesting overlap in, in their reporting and what Beijing has been saying. Uh, the traditional media, and there's others, but this is the main case, traditional media in Taiwan have also played a role in legitimizing uh, disinformation, fake news, misinformation that originates in uh, the other important playground, which is uh, social media. Uh, so basically, Line groups. For those of you who've never heard of Line, it's a it's a WhatsApp kind of application that I thought was Japanese, but I'm told is South Korean uh, and very popular in Taiwan. Uh, and this is where the action is as well for the exchange of information, posting news, and discussions, and, and whatnot. Uh, as part of my uh, pet projects, I have been trying to track uh, activities primarily 
study on Facebook. I don't use Lime. Uh, and what we've seen in recent months is the emergence of a constellation of pages that basically are all sharing the same information that are uh, supposedly the public pages of uh, civic organizations that are all very much on the same page when it comes to unification and all that. Uh, they have been promoting uh, pro-unification rallies in Taiwan. They have served as conduits for attempted recruitment of students to party schools back in Taiwan. Uh, and then they were uh, kind enough to leave a cell phone number that we could link back to the uh, Red Party in Taiwan, which is a new political party that was created soon after President Tsai was elected. Uh, that is very much committed to unification work and all that. So we're seeing a direct connection here between uh, CCP party schools back in China and the registered political party in Taiwan that is operating on their behalf or at least supporting their activities. Um, there is uh, high evidence that uh, non-Taiwanese are involved in generating content as well on these pages. There seems to be high involvement by uh, Chinese Malaysians, for example, uh, using lots of fake, or seemingly fake pages as well with no profile picture. Uh, and oftentimes language that uh, contains elements that indicate that uh, this is not generated here, there, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, there's also signs of uh, high coordination or perhaps automation as well. If information appears on one page uh, within a matter of minutes, it will appear in several other pages. Then we'll make the jump online groups and other uh, chat uh, devices. And then eventually will be uh, legitimized, if you will, in traditional media in Taiwan that are willing uh, repeater station, if you will, for disinformation and propaganda. Um, the Chinese as well seem to be well aware of the deficiencies that exist in the traditional media environment in Taiwan. Uh, and this is something that I've observed over the years. There's uh, poor traditions of journalism in many media in Taiwan, uh, mostly uh, <coughs> due to requirements <coughs> on reporters to produce huge amounts of news material on, on a daily basis. Uh, which means that sometimes they cannot simply be physically uh, in two locations at the same time, so they will rely on friends who sometimes work for competitor media uh, for second-hand information about what they said at a particular press conference. Uh, there are very poor uh, corroboration practices in Taiwanese media, uh, which means that often a reporter or editor will see content from somewhere, will not uh, seek out a second source to try to verify information, and will uh, oftentimes as, as their own information rather than indicate that it came from a, another media. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, something that has played a huge role in uh, assisting the spread of, of this information is the fact that in a highly competitive media environment like Taiwan, if one particular media outlet online or in print releases or publishes an article, Every single other media organization in Taiwan will have to repeat the same thing and oftentimes not mention which media that information came from, which basically gives a whole, it amplifies a message, it gives a, you know, it, 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 the, uh, the half-life of a piece of this information and makes it particularly difficult for the government uh, or targeted individuals or organizations to counter that this information in a way that basically uh, counters that, uh, that particular piece of this information. Uh, other areas where we've seen, oh, this is more on the uh, these are uh, what are known as content farms or content mills. Uh, that's a small uh, number of such websites that have been discovered in, in recent months. Um, the Chinese are getting better as well at using those content farms. Initially, the material would be created by people back in China. Sometimes they were quite clumsy and would write that in simplified Chinese. So for a Taiwanese audience, it's quite obvious it doesn't come from Taiwan. Uh, then they started uh, paying, again, Chinese in, in Malaysia, for example, to generate content. Now there is uh, every reason to believe that they're investing pretty substantial amounts of money to hire people in Taiwan uh, to generate that disinformation content. So it, it's, if you're a Taiwanese consuming this material, now it sounds like more credible and legitimate because it uses the same expressions, because it's in uh, traditional Chinese and, and whatnot. So as I said, this is just a small number. These uh, media are growing in long weeks. Uh, and it's actually quite fascinating how often information that originated on these websites has found its way into uh, traditional reporting. Uh, 
one. So that's a big challenge uh, for everybody involved. Um, and then uh, going back to uh, Mr. Tsai and the One China Times group, as mentioned earlier, there was a forum last month in Beijing, uh, which is the fifth to be held uh, that basically uh, encourages collaboration between media and journalists on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Uh, the first one that was held in 2015, which is kind of interesting that they would start uh, organizing those at a time when it had become obvious that the KNT was on its way out and that time when would probably be elected. Uh, the first one had 33 participants from Taiwan, uh, from print and television. Uh, the one that was held in Beijing last month had uh, more than 70 people from Taiwan and uh, from you know, broadcast associations, television, uh, new media, magazines, creative media, film industry. Uh, so they've widened the scope as well of participants. Uh, overall, there were about 200 uh, people from Chinese and, and Taiwanese media, uh, including a youth section from uh, from Taiwan. And uh, Tsai Ming himself was there leading the delegation. So was his son, and uh, Jason Wu as well, Taichung Mayor, who is now uh, involved with uh, the Walk China Times group. Uh, reports indicate that the uh, the media in question signed a number of cooperation agreements with their counterparts in China. We don't know yet what that means, uh, but there were also all participants were told, uh, again, as David said earlier, that it is now their, their responsibility to reinforce notions of uh, oneness of, the, of all the Chinese, uh, 1992 consensus, one country, two systems, uh, which is the proposal that uh, Xi Jinping has extended to the Taiwanese, uh, and that is their responsibility to work towards those ideals and to reinforce those, uh, those notions. Uh, and that continues as well. They had some experts. There was uh, this information as well in, in that particular instance uh, where one of the guests from Taiwan was supposedly uh, consultant for Tianxia, so Commonwealth Magazine, which is a well-respected uh, publication in Taiwan. And then the person in question came out the following day. She said, I am absolutely not a consultant for uh, uh, Commonwealth Magazine. So whether it was a mistake on the part of the organizers or they wanted us to believe that it's not the China Times and TVBSs of this world, but also uh, more reasonable media that were not willing to participate in those in those forums, uh, remain to be uh, to be determined. How much time do I have? Left? Three to five minutes. Okay, go more than ten minutes. Then. Um, another area that we've seen as well that has had a particular impact on self censorship in in Taiwanese media uh, is the weaponization will of advertisement revenue. Uh, what we've seen, and this has been going on for quite a while, is uh, large businesses that have uh, interests in China will deny uh, front page ads to media that are focusing on certain controversial issues and uh, And then conversely, uh, those same companies rewarding media that choose not to report on these issues. Uh, China uh, cross trade trade agreements and whatnot will be reward, rewarded with uh, ad placement by Chinese corporations. They're not reinventing the wheel by doing so. This is something that has been going on in media in Hong Kong for many, many years. Uh, but we've seen that, and once again, you compare the front pages of, of media following certain controversies, and uh, one China Times, the front page will be completely plastered with, uh, with advertisements, whereas Liberty Times, for example, would have reported. Uh, on the set, set controversy. So uh, for a media environment that, uh, like everywhere else, is suffering financially and oftentimes coming to stay afloat, this can make the difference between uh, a media continuing its operations and going out of business, which is particularly problematic with these smaller online media that have emerged in, in recent years, um, mm -hmm. mostly stemming out of disillusionment with traditional media where they felt they were facing certain constraints. Or not, uh, but the survivability and viability of those media is quite contingent on finding uh, financial support. Uh, large corporations normally will not support them, so they rely on advertisement. If the advertisement dries up, chances are they're going to have to go out of business. So this is uh, this is quite a challenge as well for uh, for Taiwan. And I think I will end here and uh, focus more on the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. All right, next question to Michael Masadek at the very uh, end of the table. So we heard from Michael Cole about what's going on in the Taiwan situation, but uh, Mike, if you could please set the 
full landscape for this phenomenon um, that we are witnessing. Yeah, I just I'm going to sort of hop around the world just a little bit. But as you were describing the infiltration, particularly on social media, my thoughts went to the Mueller report. Uh, what was out laid out there? Uh, I mean, physically, mainland China and, and Taiwan are rather close. There's quite a considerable physical, linguistic, every other distance between Putin's former chef and the electorate of the United States. But as laid out in the Mueller report, what this uh, company did, I mean, he's no longer cooking. He's cooking up <laughs> phony information on the internet, had an incredible spread and, uh, and reach in the United States uh, last election. So this is a phenomenon that is spreading. For all I know, Putin and Xi may have talked about it at their, uh, at their last summit. Uh, another point, sometime on Sunday, I read on Twitter, that someone posted on c a line, folks, look beyond the firewall to what's going on in law. Well, that post vanished uh, within minutes after it was posted. Perhaps the person who posted it also vanished. We don't, we don't know what happened to him or her. Uh, but the total effort of China to control current information and history fit together as a blend. Uh, I've also read that if you went into the streets now in Shenzhen and asked people what's going on in Hong Kong, most of them would have no idea. Just as if you asked a lot of people in China what happened on Tiananmen Square 30 years ago, a lot of them would have at best a fuzzy idea or no, no idea. Uh, I briefly get into the one country, two systems. My tutorials on this came from the late great Alan Romberg, who constantly reminded people like me who had nowhere near his expertise the one country, two systems was originally designed for Taiwan. And then the Hong Kong uh, handover issue came along and they said, oh, well, let's, let's expropriate the idea and try it, uh, try it out in Hong Kong. Well, now we've tried it out for X number of years uh, and we'll see to the extent to which the people in Taiwan think it's working very well. And then to see, you know, we've had all these influence operations going on that Michael Cole is so well described. Is the biggest influence operation going to be going on in the Taiwan election of people looking at what's going on in Hong Kong right now and, and making a decision that was not otherwise, um, otherwise anticipated by the early, by the early uh, polls. Um, in terms of American media, I remember 20 years ago, in the late 1980s, early 90s, no more in the 90s, a lot of respectable, serious American news organizations were carrying stories of the Internet's going to be great because it's going to open up China, that people in China are going to get all this information and they're all going to become democratic. Well, we know where this is led. We have social credit, we have facial recognition. China has learned to use, the CCP has learned to use uh, the internet to its own advantage. And then the final point I want to make is in terms of interlocking issues. Uh, we've got First of all, you have to wonder if you're sitting in the complex in Beijing where the top guys are, where on their list of priorities at the moment is Taiwan? Because they've got to worry about the trade situation with the United States, 
Huawei, Hong Kong, uh, maybe Taiwan, blessedly, is getting further down on their list of priorities for, for a few weeks. Uh, but there was an interesting column in today's um, uh, in, uh, FT that do we know that President Trump, you may like him or not like him, but that human rights is generally not on the top of his uh, diplomatic uh, party list. But the fact that the guy does know how to bargain and leverage situations, that he may well use Hong Kong in these talks coming up, the G20 and whatever goes on beyond, uh, as a little bit of leverage on uh, President Xi with his, his concern is the trade deal. Uh, but if he can use other things as leverage, uh, maybe he will. And then, of course, part of the trade situation is the Huawei situation. Uh, and again, to what extent we have such a interlocking global economy that companies like Google, American-based technology companies, are trying to get exemption from the Huawei ban because their systems are tied into it. So everything is connected in, um, in one way or the other. And uh, we'll see how it all uh, plays out. Great, thank you, Mike. Um, thank you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna build on your point about um, China's social credit system and facial recognition um, internally. And then I'm gonna look also more externally. Um, and I wanna ask Natalie and Ian if you could comment um, on your, your views of the Chinese Communist Party's strategic aims. What is it trying to achieve? And I also remember sharing with me a, an interesting story about her time as a reporter in China in the 1990s. Um, and in, in addition to that, what have you both experienced here in Washington? Well, I think there's a Two speakers ahead of me uh, made it, you know, laid out a good uh, ground for this discussion. For me, uh, my observation uh, is that China tried to build a digital wall to block out the, out, you know, information from outside. But inside, uh, from coming inside, but to the, the outside, they tried to utilize the democratic system to influence or even destroy the democratic country, the society. Um, that's what we've been dealing uh, on a daily basis uh, in my current job. For one example, um, that we could not put a reporter on the ground, um, so we have to try very hard to make sure you know our information uh, get into uh, our audience and listeners, because that's our mission uh, in our day. Uh, so for me, I'm very curious how many people actually are listening or trying, you know, uh, to use a VPN to reach out to those information. So I try to ask every dissident or, you know, people I know uh, recently came out from China because I know they really, uh, they're really hungry for information from outside. Like the uh, Hong Kong incident, uh, we check out, you know, all the Chinese major media, no report at all. Even the June 4th Tiananmen, just as Michael uh, mentioned, even China Time, they were asked, you know, to delete all their database, anything on related to June 4th, because China Times is one of the very few newspapers from Taiwan accessible to the uh, ordinary Chinese. So I, uh, China really tried hard, but I'm also surprised, you know, many people told me, I actually recently came from China, they, they did, you know, Listen. They didn't have the access to listen or the, uh, read our article. Uh, one interesting story I want to share is that you know we had an interview with one of the Tiananmen mother. She mentioned that her son uh, was missing uh, 30 years ago uh, uh, near the Tiananmen. Uh, and then when the program was after the program was broadcasted, you know an audience in China contacted our reporters. And was there on site, saw her son get killed. So he said he buried this secret in his heart for 30 years. It's so painful. 
uh, he couldn't uh, endure this anymore. So he contacted our reporter and he said he wanted to tell this, you know, what happened to the Tiananmen mother. That was amazing that, you know, somebody who lived in, in China actually can reach out to the uh, Tiananmen mother because our, our program. So uh, I think for our challenging today, uh, on the one hand is to gather information. We have a lot of so-called uh, citizen journalists. They give us a uh, story lead or a uh, feed and video. Uh, but for, for us, the challenge is how to verify. So we really had to try very hard, you know, to reach out the governmental comments and try uh, second sources to verify the information or sometimes reach out to dissidents. You know, a lot of documents are circulated. We have to ma make sure they make sense or because it's really nowadays to fake documents or uh, even video. So when uh, the time uh, is very time consuming, but that's very important. And even that, you know, one example is that uh, from our Tibetan service, uh, we, we got a picture, you know, a Tibetan living inside of uh, China putting on the animal fur because this is uh, the tip said, you know, uh, China is trying to humiliate the Dalai Lama after he said, you know, we should love animals, not kill animals. And so this picture sent out to our uh, our company say, you know, Chinese try to humiliate Dalai Lama by asking those people to put on animal farm. And our reporter tried to identify this information with the three different sources in different world. And they all said, yeah, we come from that. But the next day we found out, you know, that we were flashed by Chinese government and said, you know, this is a fake news. You got to try to, you know, distort it. And we, they, we trace back and then find out, you know, all these three people got their information from one source. So even though you try very hard to reach out three sources living in different corner of the world, and then you find out they were all closely related and connected. So that's the challenge for uh, people who cover China nowadays, especially you don't have the people on the ground. So I think uh, the, the information one thing I think it's very encouraging is that when we uh, dealing with China's influence, we saw you know, much dogs, not just like NGO, but just individual around the world now are you know give a much bigger value uh, or concern about what Chinese is doing in their own country. You don't see that maybe five years ago. Now uh, we have a people in. You know, Canada and other uh, part of the democratic countries that they pay close attention to what Chinese is doing in their own country. So they, they uh, give a warning to people, but also systematically, sometimes they write a book or article monitoring what happened. Uh, I think for a long time, people didn't really realize, you know, with the many immigrants or with the power of. Chinese company overseas. Um, this, you know, this kind of power and influence uh, are penetrating their democratic system and trying to influence their life and set an agenda for you know for their discussion or even got the uh, candidates that pro China can be elected. Uh, the other thing I want to mention here. Um, I think not, Taiwan not only pay, um, Michael mentioned the influence of the Chinese in Taiwanese media. A lot of time uh, it's a, you know, they, they try to um, influence the China policy, but one other thing uh, from my observation is that those pro-China media not only attack, you know, the opposition, uh, DPP or any, uh, Independence group, but one very important strategy is to demoralize uh, Taiwan allies like Japan and the U.S. I think this is one uh, aspect. Uh, maybe not many people pay attention to those uh, talk show program because Trump 
the U.S. has a very negative image in those uh, pro, uh, media. Because I watch um, quite a few of the talk show, you know, it's all like the U.S. is very arrogant or you know, the Trump is trying to impose U.S. will on people. So China, uh, type of Taiwan, because China to isolate Taiwan on the international stage, allies is very important. So when U.S. sell arms of Taiwan to defend itself, you will hear actually strong voices in Taiwan uh, criticizing. You know, U.S. is trying to sell or you know force Taiwan to buy their own security. Uh, so I think U.S. Uh, China is using many different tactics, um, basically uh, to make to. Uh, to make it the trend in their advantage um, for now. I, I think I will stop here or we can talk um, more in the Q&A. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I'd like to first say uh, what I'm not before I go on with uh, what I'm what am. I am not a spokesperson for the agency that currently involve, uh, employs me, which is uh, Voice of America. I am paid by the U U.S. government. I have been since for quite a number of years, but I am not speaking on behalf of the U.S. government. That said, I have had a uh, the long journalism career. Um, was it um, Mike? Talk about the um, situation in Hong Kong and the um, um, one country, two systems, uh, system, etc. I remember back in 1992 when I worked for the Washington Times. One of the stories I wrote was an interview with uh, then Senator Mitch McConnell on the Hong Kong bill. So that, that that that's an example. That's a little bit of evidence. As journalists, we like to point to evidence. And uh, that's evidence of how long I've been in business. And um, in 1997 and 98, I worked for CBS News, uh, Beijing uh, Bureau as, as a producer. And the story that David, uh, our uh, moderator here, references uh, is uh, an, an episode where I was uh, actually arrested by the uh, Beijing authorities and handcuffed and um, driven by, uh, what do you call that, Michael, um, um, a convoy <laughs> escorted by a police convoy to, a, uh, to an undisclosed location. To this day, I do not know where precisely that location was because um, after we had passed some distance on the highway uh, with uh, police cars and sirens, um, with that sort of significant escort, um, they uh, put blindfold on me, saying, we cannot let you know where, where you're going. And um, I, that in, in that time, I was put in solitary confinement, and I asked them this question. Sorry, you know, I, I am a journalist, so we do, uh, that's what we do, ask questions and um, try and find truth from our research, from answers to questions, etc. So one question I put them was, yes, I, I interviewed uh, dissidents, this and that, including Wei Jingsheng's brother, who unfortunately uh, died recently in Paris without being able to go back to his um, um, country, his birth uh, country and uh, the city of Beijing. Um, something that he uh, very much uh, felt sad about. And so I said, I yes, I interviewed dissidents, etc. But we also, we, because as the Beijing Bureau producer, I was responsible for proposing story ideas, not only for our, for our senior Asia correspondent, who was then based in Tokyo, but Dan Rather and Scott Pelley, the White House correspondent then, uh, because everybody comes through Beijing. So I said, what about the stories we did on uh, state enterprise reform? You know, the uh, SOE and, and stuff, and toy factories, 
Guangdong exports. So I don't think they um, they took that uh, uh, as uh, my my explanation or way of telling them. A journalist's job is to tell the full story. I mean, the, the story about China back then was not the same as the story today. That has changed. 1997 and 2019. 20 past, if my math is correct. 2022. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, state owned enterprise reform, you can barely see that on any uh, front page or inside the newspapers anymore. But um, I don't think they get the fact that we journalists cover all aspects of news and what we find important. And uh, if you're not with them, I think they think you are against them. And this is troublesome. And uh, in my reporting since, um, I think I detect that they, that mentality has perhaps continued a bit. And um, this is a uh, truly unfortunate. Uh, I, while I cannot speak on behalf of our agency or, or the US government, I believe I can speak of my journalist training. And uh, I cannot emphasize enough the, um, the fundamental fact of our job, which is uh, trying to uh, find truth and share the uh, broader society out there the truth as best as we can find. And truth often has many as uh, multifaceted. And as, um, as uh, my fellow uh, panelists have pointed out, increasingly challenging to get to. But that doesn't stop us from trying. The one thing I have uh, thought of uh, and noticed is uh, sometimes it's not just in the answers people give, that you have to uh, not necessarily trust, verify. It's even in the questions that are being raised and who raised these questions. So to uh, elaborate on that a bit, um, sometimes I have to ask myself, why are these people raising these questions at this time? And what are trying to uh, accomplish. So in the end, um, who and what interests do they serve? I mean, do these questions and explorations of these questions ultimately serve? And in particular, um, in, in a lot of people, um, and not necessarily in China per se, but um, for example, as a journalist, Questions raised by, for example, even um, seemingly benign entities. Um, what are they? And questions or so-called facts fed to journalists, which means uh, questions or, or facts, quote-unquote facts, they bring to you rather than what journalists, journalists themselves go out to seek, research, and find out. I would be, as a journalist, particularly um, vigilant about with information that is fed to me. I mean, what, what is their goal eventually? And a lot of times uh, these questions or information could be wrapped in very benign, democratic sounding terms, but you have to uh, appeal it, you know, like an or something to see, you know, what does this question, what does this investigation lead to in order to find out who they, you know, they truly represent. So what they say, who they say, what they are, and what they are for, what they stand for, isn't necessarily what or who they truly are and what and who they are truly for. And I it is as a journalist and who's in the business for 20 some years and uh, who's constantly, who, who's forced to be vigilant about information, about things people say. And that's nonpartisan, that's uh, across the board, 
Times. When I was arrested, uh, journalism trade organizations, Reporters Without Borders, Committee to Protect Journalists, they all uh, voiced strong concerns and support on my behalf. So I'm saying this as a journalist, uh, a long time journalist. All right, um, so next question, and um, maybe just one or two of the panelists is open to everyone. Um, shorter response, we could leave more time for Q&A. Um, so you know, what are the signs of PRC, China's influence on media elections in Taiwan? And I think we covered that a lot already. So the second part of that, you know, how about uh, PRC influence in media elections in the US, and what do you see today? Uh, my sense is that PRC influence is the main story in Taiwan, but it looks like it's more about Russia influence. But that said, um, you know, for PRC activities directed toward Taiwan and the U.S., how are they similar, different, and what lessons do they share to one another? Let's keep this one shorter so we can carve out more time for the Q&A with the audience. Um, I'll jump in very quickly. I mean, one, one, one area actually ties Taiwan with the U.S. in terms of Chinese interference is uh, some of you might be familiar with the what's known as the 311 base. It's a it base in Fujian province. Uh, it's basically a PLA arm that focuses very much, traditionally since the 1950s, uh, has worked on electronic disinformation sites, radio, uh, targeting Taiwan psychologically, basically psychological warfare and all that. Uh, in recent years, and probably coinciding with the rapprochement that we've seen between the U.S. Uh, and Taiwan on their Taiwan, uh, we've seen a shift uh, in the orientation of 311 base that now seems to be uh, aimed at targeting the Americans uh, and on issues such as uh, U.S. arms sales to Taiwan and basically trying to convince them, the Americans, that it's no longer in the U.S. interest to provide that kind of assistance mm -hmm. to Taiwan. Uh, if the Chinese uh, felt compelled to also try to interfere uh, in the U.S. election, probably trying to counter what the Russians are trying to do here, uh, 311 base would probably also be one of the main nodes where uh, coordination of these types of activities is, uh, is taking place. Thank you. I think it actually just remind me, I have to make a disclaimer. <laughs> Since you know, my organization is also government funded, I'm not speaking on behalf of my organization. I think uh, one thing people may think, uh, we pay more, how many people pay more attention to what is doing and U.S. is uh, paying more attention to what Russian is doing. But actually, as I know, uh, the Taiwanese, you know, uh, focus very much on what uh, Russian has done in Crimea. Uh, there, they found that there is similarity in these two cases because, you know, apparently uh, Russia posed military threats, economic incentives, political propaganda, you know, a fostering agent, cyber international blockade and to influence uh, the Crimea and actually the, the same tactics has been used by Chinese uh, on Taiwan so a group of people actually in Taiwan have studied uh, Crimea and Russians uh, strategy and tactics pretty closely and we're not just only paying you know attention to what Chinese is doing uh, on the manipulation of the United States. First of all, I'd be surprised if the Chinese didn't look at 2016 and figure, hey, if it's that easy, we ought to try it, we ought to try it ourselves. Uh, although you have to remember that a lot of the Russian stuff was influenced by it was pure hatred for Hillary Clinton. It was a visceral, personal uh, thing. But the other point, uh, is the internet there's something about the internet that that <clears throat> just there's a tendency for people to believe even though they hate the established press and think it lies and everything they'll believe anything they hear and see on the internet and I got my first abrupt training in that in the 2008 election when a, a re reputable poll came out that 50 percent of registered Republicans believed that Obama was a Muslim. Well, where did they learn this? On the internet. Period. So I think the internet is out there as a really powerful force, unedited, unsupervised, on anything. 
uh, to manipulate people far more than the establishment press, despite what people say about the establishment. Um, I uh, have not been uh, covering U.S.-China one of street relations full time since uh, um, April 2017 when I transferred out of uh, the OA China branch to VOA's uh, English division we call Central News. VOA uh, has 47 language uh, services and Mandarin service, uh, Cantonese service, a smaller Cantonese service are uh, some of those language services. Um, but I do continue to uh, report on uh, international affairs and have to say that the China factor is hard to miss or discount. I wrote a story on, uh, say, the Korean Peninsula, um, I believe it was last year, and it was a uh, very, it was the most uh, popular article on our website, our English language website, for quite a while and generated a great deal of comments. And um, one, I remember the last section of the article dealt with uh, the headline was uh, um, a sort of uh, uh, an assumption or just sort of, sort of a, a game, uh, a war game or a geostrategic uh, game thinking uh, hypothesis that uh, the potential scenario of a China takeover of North Korea. So, um, and the last of the article talk about the uh, impact of that potential scenario, which is uh, the spread of illiberalism. And just uh, imagine that thought. So that, a lot of people responded about that. And uh, the spread of illiberalism is uh, a concept or an idea Perhaps a, uh, I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say a, an increasing concern in in the uh, among the public here, as I, I can observe. I mean, to talk about uh, previous reporting experiences in Taiwan, I was uh, posted to Taiwan first in uh, 2005. That's when I first met Michael. <laughs> And uh, I was posted there again back in uh, 2013. And uh, I had grown up in um, mainland China, so Taiwan, uh, the so called Treasure Island, what was quite new to me. And uh, there were some, uh, quite some differences between 2005 and 2013. And we can perhaps talk about that a bit later. I want to make one point that I forgot that. I don't know specifically what issue China might want to influence the United States on, but there have been a couple columns by some fairly thoughtful people recently that the conventional wisdom along the tank alley and elsewhere in Washington. It's 15 hours. Uh, <laughs> no, it's a computer military sounding thing. Um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, we're heading for a new Cold War or something with China. But these columnists are making the point, does the American public have any kind of an appetite for anything like restarting a Cold War? And so it perhaps is what the Chinese mainly be thinking about is to try and keep projecting themselves to the United States as one, a very valuable economic source, particularly for farmers in the Midwest and caterpillar tractors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the other is sort of, you know, warm and cuddly panda land. Uh, and to get to the point, since we're talking about Taiwan, if there's an appetite for a cold new cold war, is there any appetite, particularly for a non-interventionist president and administration, into any kind of military conflict over in Taiwan. Great. Thank you, Mike. Um, with that, we have a lot of expert expertise here, so I'll turn to the audience. Um, and we'll start with this gentleman in the front. Okay. Uh, my name is Sean Lee. And then I'll go to the gentleman in the back. <laughs>
<coughs> My name is Xiang Ling from the WTR Radio and Sound of Radio Network. So, um, for last year's midterm election in Taiwan, there so many reports about the underground gambling business involved in swindling the vote. Uh, so, just wondering if any analysts can give further comment on that. There are many uh, social media mentioned about CCP is putting a lot of funding on this underground uh, gambling business to strengthen the world. Well, I was actually talking about that in an earlier meeting, so it's fresh in my, in my memory. Uh, yeah, there was a lot of reporting. Actually, the Minister of Justice Investigation Bureau in Taiwan also uh, alluded to that particular uh, incident, if you will. Uh, what came out of these, these uh, reports and investigations is Basically, that for a while it looked like his opponent, Tejimai from DPP, was well ahead of him in the polls. So that if you bet, or who was kind of this outlier left field candidate that nobody had ever heard of, uh, and he by accident won, you stood to make a lot of money. Um, so there is always a possibility that uh, people willingly chose to vote not for their preference. But for someone like I worry because they thought that hey if he actually wins we're gonna make a lot of money uh, You involve organized crime in these activities uh, most triads on particularly Bamboo Union are, are involved in pro unification activities as well uh, And then you possibly inject a lot of money coming from China uh, To help pay for these these activities uh, That could be that could have a significant impact on, on elections and, and border decisions now that means uh, would that in and of itself have been sufficient to sway the election in Kaohsiung? I don't think so. Uh, I don't have access to the intel and law enforcement uh, documentation to demonstrate that. But if you add that to a bunch of other influence operations, uh, then that would certainly have an impact on the election. That said as well, uh, Han won, won by a fairly wide margin in the election. So I don't think that, again, alone would have been uh, sufficient to, uh, to help him. But if it did work, uh, and it is documented by people who have bad intentions, uh, nothing would prevent them from using that again, and possibly more uh, in a more fashion to have an impact on, on future elections. And with that in mind, I'm certainly thinking of, uh, of 2020. The problem, though, is that uh, like law enforcement has alluded to several instances where they were investigating uh, possible interference by the Chinese. Uh, but following that report by the uh, uh, NJIB, never were given access to the actual information and determinations as to whether they did find uh, involvement by the Chinese that had an impact on the elections. So I think now the next, the next responsibility for Taiwanese government would be to somehow sanitize uh, those uh, those investigations and render that publicly so that the Taiwanese audience knows what happened, who were the actors, what mechanisms were used, uh, how it affected the elections, and what can be done to, uh, to mitigate or uh, counter these uh, we're not there just yet. I mean, just one one point. I remember uh, I, have a, I have covered uh, news in Taiwan for 11 years. I think it, for the political reporter in Taiwan, when you watch the uh, re, uh, election result, of course, we monitor pool very closely. Gambling is one thing that all reporter has to monitor. Sometimes it's even more accurate than the pool. Because, you know, in the, because uh, if you make well, for sometimes, you know, there's some uh, vote of uh, people who receive the phone call will uh, on purposely, you know, mislead the pullers. Because like the early days, if you support the, uh, the opposition party, you don't want to tell, you know, the pullers that you, who are you going to vote. So there will be a, mis you know, a gap between uh, the poor and the reality. So I think before the election night, uh, in the newsroom, all the political we're talking about what's the gambling situation now, who got the most bet, and then of course reporter in Taiwan also bet themselves. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what, can I have a follow quick follow up? I was wondering what's the penalty with the Taiwanese government enhancing against people using political you know, gambling? Do you know? Uh, well, I think that gambling in general is still illegal in so I don't gamble myself, so I wouldn't know, but uh, there's, <laughs> there's penalties. Uh, what remains to be seen is whether uh, not only instances of gambling, 
uh, in the context of democratic elections, whether the fines should be or penalties should be higher. My opinion is that they should. I don't believe that's the case uh, under current law in Taiwan. I could be mistaken, but I don't think it is. The gentleman back. Sure. I'm a Peter Hartford, Council Sales, a former diplomat. Um, Mike, I'm not sure that Cold War and, and sales of agricultural products should be exclusive. We sure sold a lot of wheat to the Soviet Union. And there, and there are probably uh, between the 1.4 or more Muslim, million Muslims being locked up in China and the billions of dollars of technology theft. I don't think there's a lot of pan the hug is left in the US. Uh, my question is along the lines of this week's news. Uh, seems to me the two China policy is dead. I, I can't see a single Taiwanese, even with an IQ lower than a wombat, uh, now signing on to the two China policy for fear that someday he himself is going to be extradited to China to face God knows what. Are Chinese media sort of going nuts to pointing this out that, you know, two systems is dead? I'll, I'll let somebody else answer about the two China. Our economic relationship with China is so much deeper and wider and more vast than it was with Tarkic Soviet Union, where we sold them a few bushels of wheat uh, for a couple of years. Uh, it's very interlocking. And so that's one of the reasons I make whether we're going to have a new Cold War or something, you know, I, I don't know. But there's just, I'm just reflecting on the kind of talk that you hear in every policy wonk gathering in Washington these days. All right. Ms. One point to make. I think for the Taiwanese, um, there's an identity issue there. It's different from the U.S. You know, it's very clear in the U.S. It's a competition of a two superpower. So if you're talking about the Chinese influence, at least in Washington, we see a great deal of consensus from the two parties, major parties here. You know, what's the strategy, or should China become the I? Defined as a competitor, but I think in if in Taiwan, even with the Hong Kong situation, I think we still have, you know, a great vision of the people um, think differently. They still have a, a vision for a possible peace agreement with China or unification in the long term. So that's that's a different situation uh, from the U.S. I think what you meant is one country, two system is that, uh, and I think it is. Is definitely, and what's going on this week in Hong Kong is certainly focusing minds. The problem is that, uh, I mean, the one offer that Beijing has made to Taiwan is one country, two system, and that was reaffirmed by Xi Jinping in his uh, address to Taiwanese compatriots on January 2nd. Uh, I think that insistence on a system that is purely failing in Hong Kong uh, stems from the fact that uh, to this day the CCP just does not understand democracy in general, and even less so how it applies. Uh, and it's also they're also governed right now by a guy who you know, claims to be an expert on Taiwan because of the years that he spent in, in Fujian. Uh, it's quite authoritarian in his views, and he does not seem to be listening to his advisors on Taiwan. So basically, what that means is that he's given up on winning the hearts and minds of the Taiwanese. Uh, incentives are failing. Ideology is certainly failing. Now they're in a moment where they're going to dictate the terms, uh, and I don't see under his guard uh, any. Um, appealing offer of being made to the Taiwanese, and even if they did, uh, I don't think that it would win over the Taiwanese because they would stand to lose something no matter what offer is given to Beijing. Uh, and on top of that, it's clearly obvious that whatever promise that the CCP makes, makes you, uh, they're not going to respect it. And again, Hong Kong is, is uh, evidence of that. Right, um, to make an efficient use of time, we'll just take two or three at once to bundle um, Milo and then Katie. I'm naming it for you, please. Uh, my own chair. Uh, I'm an intern at the Public County 49 Institute. Um, so my question is on uh, when you have a uh, media owners, CEOs, politicians who are in favor of closer ties between Taiwan and China, 
and doing uh, conferences, events, traveling to China. And most of them, a lot of them are Taiwanese. And um, so I'm wondering at what point do you, um, when these actors, politicians, uh, owners are pushing for Beijing's agenda and uh, say China Times, CCI, um, extremely pushing for a one country, two system, reunification, uh, things like that. At what point do uh, as, uh, as the Taiwan watchers say, this is enough, uh, you, this is not okay? Um, yeah, I would like the experts to comment on that. Thank you, uh, KQ Wang with NTD TV. Um, actually, uh, Michael, you mentioned about those um, um, Taiwan uh, media high level uh, those management went to Beijing and joined the conference. Actually, my observation is not only for Taiwan media, but uh, they invited uh, all the Chinese language uh, media in the United States and other countries um, from time to time go to Beijing and give them um, orders or whatever. Uh, actually, um, there are very, very few real independent media in this country, Chinese language media. I mean, either they were influenced or, um, or they have self censorship and so on. So that's my observation. But also, like a Hoover Institute have the report that they're talking about this. Very few independent uh, Chinese language media here. So um, uh, my question is uh, last year we have seen that, uh, like, CGTV. Uh, were required by DOJ to register as a foreign agent yeah, under the U.S. law. Um, I'm just wondering, in Taiwan or other countries, are there such requirement? Uh, because if we really um, strictly enforce, enforce this law, maybe many <laughs> Chinese language media, they could be qualified for this. And uh, maybe that will give them a warning or something. You know, they should be more uh, Good. So those two for now. We have Milo asking about, you know, when people in Taiwan are so much in favor of, of, you, of China, Taiwan, strengthening those ties, mm -hmm. uh, did that cross some lines? You know, when is that you say that that's just too much uh, in favor of that? And then Kitty about uh, registering for a foreign agent and that, is there such a requirement or should there be in Taiwan? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Uh, thanks for your question, Milo. Well, it's it's the thing like Taiwanese are quite cynical about about China Times group in general, uh, and they're like, well, okay, we know it's propaganda. Uh, we're not going to buy it. We're not going to buy products, and eventually, market forces are going to push it out of the market. Right? Uh, the problem that uh, that we're seeing with this is that uh, ultimately, the China Times group does not depend on selling newspapers to make money, uh, so they can afford to for people not to buy their product, uh, and they even can afford to be fined by the for you know willingly spreading this information but again they don't care as I said when you receive something like 495 uh, million US dollars from the Chinese government uh, for your holdings company in Hong Kong like who cares about a million dollar NT dollar fine back in Taiwan right uh, should there be stricter regulations that would compel such a media organization uh, to change its ways or basically it out of business. Uh, not so far, I don't think the authorities are even willing to go in that direction because that opens the door to, to abuse as well. Uh, if you have a new administration in government starting next year, you know, who's going to decide what is disinformation and what isn't? Uh, as the editor of Taiwan Sentinel, oh, I'm okay in Taiwan right now. If a, you know, I'm worried we're elected president starting on May 20th next year, probably that would be accused of disinformation and you know, they would target so we have to be very careful with these kinds of uh, these kinds of laws, but certainly there ought to be more controls, or at least uh, the punitive measures taken by the CC and, and other agencies should be a lot higher, so that it, it actually compels uh, media owners to uh, you know take their their business a bit more seriously. But convincing Tsai and Ming, who himself is very Taiwanese, uh, to to change his ways again, the reason why he does that is you know I assume it's to have the kind of access to the Chinese market that, uh, that he's enjoyed, and that's why he's the second wealthiest individual in Taiwan. I think Kitty just raised a very interesting question because last year I got an email from a, a US uh, reporter based in Beijing actually uh, asked me, you know, uh, who is paying 
about free Chinese media newspaper here. You can find that in the supermarket, you know, Chinese restaurant, and, and tons of them. And I don't know who all this uh, media and who paid for them. So we were talking about the Chinese influence here. I think it's hard for them to influence the mainstream media, but for many local uh, Chinese, they don't they don't watch the U.S. TV or newspaper, but it, they pick up those free newspaper and got a lot of information from this local newspaper. So that's one thing um, I think a, a few people has paid attention to. And I back to the uh, identity issue because you know here I don't hear a lot of controversy when they ask to the you know, Chinese media to register as a foreign agent, but in Taiwan it's a big fight. As I mentioned, you know, there's an identity issue. People have a different thought about the relation, long-term relationship with China. So even though they don't, um, they know China time is, you know, uh, lobbying or you know have their own agenda. But some some people, especially the uh, AMT, I think I think they don't like the idea to put uh, Chinese media or as a foreign agent. And another. You know, Michael mentioned that if there is a you know, government change in the future, you know, they, that, that the same you know regulation could be used as a tool to, to retaliate. Other working in Taiwan. One exception maybe should be China Review News, uh, which has been proven to have connections to Chinese intelligence, uh, and they do have correspondence in Taiwan and are actively spreading disinformation. Uh, quite worryingly, when, whenever there's conferences, you know, their photographer will go around the room and take photos of every single person in the room. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't see the Voice of America do that. So, <laughs> uh, so that's, you know, there's there's an element of intelligence collection, I, I assume, in, in these activities. Uh, and the fact that still a lot of media junkets and, you know, following uh, you know, exercises and having access to DPP headquarters, uh, that I find a bit worrying. And uh, I've raised that issue with people in government. And uh, even there, I've not seen any action taken to curtail their access to sensitive areas. So there's a little bit of naivete as well in Taiwan. Democratic, uh, anything goes, they should be allowed to do their job. Fair enough, that's fine. But if you're actually working on behalf of a foreign intelligence agency that's not declared, uh, that's something else altogether. There must be a fair number, of, and maybe you will join them, of PhD churning out dissertations on what's happened to the Hong Kong media since 1997. Even I was living there in 2013, and I would imagine there's a considerable change even in the six years since. Um, and there's, of course, a, you know, Hong Kong is a part of the special administrative region of, of, of China, and there's a much more interlocking between business groups and and corporations the purchase of, of Hong Kong media by Chinese owners Chinese companies I would think any doctoral student or anybody who carefully follows media in Hong Kong will notice a, con a continual diminution of a free exchange and a wider range of opinion and the opinion gets into a narrow narrower range all the time. Um, I think we have time to do one more bundle of questions. If you keep it more fast paced for the questions and also the um, So one, two, three, please. Uh, four, and then that'll be it. Um, Rachel Lambert, Mansfield Foundation. So clearly we have a big problem with the CCP. Um, but I was just wondering if you guys could outline some possible solutions to this and then Top of it, what we're seeing in Hong Kong is one party, two systems is facing, well, it's collapsing essentially. So I was just wondering if you guys could make some predictions for a route that Taiwan could follow going forward, considering one country, two systems is having a lot of problems, but also if Taiwan were to become independent, the CCP would undoubtedly have a massive crackdown, as we've seen them do in the past with taking away tri um, Taiwan partners and such. So I was wondering if you guys could elaborate on that. Sure. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Eric Lee. I'm with uh, Project 2049. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, the Chinese influence has been mentioned very extensively on a lot of different levels. And uh, there have been cases where you say China Review News is almost like a, an agent for uh, CAPCC very tightly um, to the CCP. And one very close as well. And I just wanted to ask, like, where do you differentiate association with CCP or CCP? <clears throat> white glove organizations and working for the CCP. Like, where is that distinction? Like, you mentioned Walmart receives so much money from the CCP indirectly or directly. Where does such organization become a foreign agent? Hi, I'm Sato Sinisha. Uh, Nadia, could you, could you tell, tell us about more uh, Chinese tactics? So you mentioned uh, China has a lot of tactics in, in, the, in intervention. So, uh, so could you tell us more about uh, these tactics we should be aware of? Thank you. The last one. Hi, I'm Melissa Ladner, German Marshall Fund. So I'm, you mentioned briefly about tactics and efforts to change perceptions amongst allies. I was wondering if there was more to efforts to do that within Europe and the Pacific Islands. Could you repeat that again, please? Yeah, so just to sort of speak a little bit more to CCP efforts to spread disinformation on Taiwan uh, within Europe. I'll just quick answer to uh, say some questions you have addressed to me. Um, I think for a, to counter uh, CCP's influence, at least you know for RFA, one mission is to provide information that has been censored to people who should know, and the other thing is to reveal you know what CCP is doing outside of China. I think like the Uyghur issue, you know, RFA is one of the uh, earliest media who closed. Uh, we had an interview with a woman who came from uh, Xinjiang, uh, who has been in you know, the re-education camp defined by the Chinese government. So this is this is what we, we uh, we're doing uh, on a daily basis. But for, for the the question you raised is about the Chinese, uh, Chinese tactics. As I said, you know, Chinese is very good at using the democratic system uh, to defend their influence. One thing, of course, people now already uh, notice uh, the Confucian, you know, Confucius Institute all over the world. You know, it's supposed to be an um, educational cultural exchange and it's welcomed by many countries, but then you realize, you know, some of Future uh, Institute is not doing what they claim they're doing. And Chinese embassy, you know, all over the world, you know, they build up uh, the organization. They have a close contact with the student organization in every campus. So you see in Canada, like the uh, the Tibetan girl got elected, you know, as the president of the student association. She was, you know, bashed on. And student, Chinese student, went to protest and asked her to be removed. So all these things that you use is just the ordinary life uh, in a democratic system. It could be challenged in a many different way. And for sometimes, I think if you open up New York Times and Washington Post, you will see the Chinese newspaper, right? Came with the, the it just said, uh, oh, it just helped you to understand. Uh, in a better way because they have a lot of cultural food you know a, a lot of traveling introduction but there's a message in, in this uh, you know free newspaper that why people want to give you things free usually the free stuff is more expensive than you think right there's something uh, there's a motive so I think it, uh, one thing I, I mentioned earlier is that the good things that they're not watchdogs you know individuals or NGO or uh, media, they really uh, they discover now that there's a tactic and a motive 
behind all this. And they write a book or you know, write an article. Sometimes they give feed to news organization to expose you know, what happened. Sometimes they provide a documentary they make, like a Confucius Institute. There was a lady um, had a, a documentary, right? Uh, I think all, we saw people uh, started to be aware and more, you know, taking more proactive actions. Um, to deal with this. Um, I think a, a, maybe 10 years ago uh, when I, because I've been in Washington for 20 years, and 10 years ago people just worry that you know this trade issue, um, <coughs> human rights issue, but they never saw that one day their they are, way of life will be challenged by a rising China. That's a very different uh, agenda in Washington talking nowadays. So, um, I, uh, everybody's, uh, all eyes are on Hong Kong these days, and I saw last night on social media, somebody put out the message, there are three non-negotiables. For Hong Kong, it's a rule of law. For Taiwan, it's uh, its democratic system. For the United States, it's technological innovation. That, that, I thought that's what, that was pretty funny. But um, uh, Michael earlier had talked about the uh, President Trump negotiating trade, Hong Kong, etc. For me, as a journalist, I think it is important to uh, think uh, about the uh, the fact or the idea of uh, what is non-negotiable for each country, for each entity, for each person, for each nation, and. Um, I think this question will only get more important, not less, as we go forward. And in terms of uh, um, President Trump and negotiations, uh, I wrote a story not long ago on um, uh, bipartisan support for a uh, possible U.S. Taiwan free trade agreement. And uh, I interviewed a, an expert at the uh, Heritage Foundation, and he told me um, he had. He's known to have uh, advised President Trump, and in the interview, which I quoted in my story, he said um, he doesn't think Taiwan is something to be negotiated. So, to share with that, and uh, before I give the mic to everybody else, an interesting fact that I observed in terms of uh, BOA, our audience's uh, response to coverage on Taiwan was um, to a lot of uh, people in mainland China, the KMT, the uh, Kuomintang, they, uh, their knowledge of the KMT initially was um, total support for their opinion, the attitude towards the KMT was for the KMT. Why? Because the KMT fought the communists. And they are a democratic force. They are, uh, you know, the non-CC and so initially, the understanding for um, the democracy in Taiwan, the system in Taiwan, the DPP in particular, was uh, was less than uh, I, I think the, the level of understanding now. And over time, I think both, both politics and reporting um, are a matter of process, and it's constantly constantly evolving both journalist knowledge base and our audience's uh, information um, constantly is uh, are being updated uh, just on the European question uh, Europe is thinking a lot more about China these days uh, as an economic entity but also politically and strategically particularly the British and the French with their uh, uh, naval operations out there. Uh, how much are thinking about Taiwan? Probably not all that much, but I think if they think more about China, they will inevitably think uh, more about uh, more about uh, Taiwan. Uh, on that point, they raise the word independence. That's a word we ought to treat very gingerly. 
uh, independence means declaration of independence by China, which isn't going to happen. That means war. And uh, so I think we need to take that off the table. And my final thought, we talked about Congress. That can be your next panel, uh, the role of Congress in the Taiwan, uh, China, U.S. Uh, relationship. Because you got to remember, the Taiwan Relations Act, which governs American policy towards China, uh, towards Taiwan, was a creature of Congress. That was one of these rare cases where foreign policy was not made by the executive branch, but was actually made in response to a decision by the executive branch to recognize Beijing and de-recognize Taiwan. 